Hey, 42 here. One of the greatest myths of childhood is that when we grow up, we'll finally be in charge. But whilst it's true that reaching adulthood means you get to choose your own bedtime and eat pizza for dinner every night, mm. the idea that we suddenly become masters of our own destinies is simply an illusion. Whether it's paying taxes or staying at home during lockdown, sometimes we all have to do things we don't want to do. Still, aside from the rules and regulations passed down by the government, our employers and our partners, we like to believe that our destinies are ours and ours alone to make. But even that's far from a sure thing. Philosophers and thinkers have been debating whether or not we truly have free will ever since some guy in a toga first wondered why on earth he drank that third flagon of wine last night. Don't worry, I'm not going to open that philosophical can of worms. I have another whole video dedicated to the topic of free will, but suffice to say, humans are quite attached to the notion of being autonomous beings that get to choose their own path in life. And it's not hard to see why. To believe the opposite is to accept that our futures have already been laid out before us, and that we are mere NPCs rather than active players. You might even say we'd be no better than zombies, which would actually be quite handy, because then I could casually segue into the topic of today's video, real life zombies. I don't know about you, but taking half an hour out of my morning to cook breakfast just isn't an option. There's always so much to do. But luckily, Huel is here to help rescue my hectic mornings. For me, Huel is a nutritionally complete breakfast that I can make in literally 30 seconds. It fills me up, it has all the essential goodness that humans need to function, and most importantly, it doesn't interrupt my workflow. To make a Huel shake, I simply add 500 mils of water to my Huel shaker bottle, add two scoops of Huel powder, and give it a good shake. My favorite is this Black Edition cookies and cream. I can't believe this stuff is actually good for me because it's so rich and chocolatey with a hint of cookies and cream. It's really good. Huel is an easy way to maintain and keep on track of nutritional goals. It's packed with 26 vitamins and minerals and it's gluten free. Oh, and it's really affordable. So click the link in the description to try Huel today. If you use my special link, you'll be supporting the channel and you'll also get a free Huel shaker bottle. So don't miss out. And thanks to Huel for sponsoring this video. Now, if you're going to be a scientific wet blanket and declare that there's no such thing as zombies, I suggest you visit IKEA on a Saturday afternoon and see for yourself. Pay close attention to the faces of the men aimlessly pushing trolleys, nodding and smiling when asked whether they prefer the Skog Scorn Scatter Cushion or the Tuv Sav. Notice the emptiness in their eyes, their vacant expressions, and the way they follow the arrows of flat pack doom as if slaves to some unseen force. Admittedly, that force is probably the promise of Swedish meatballs and a slice of dime cake, rather than the chance to feast on the brains of the living, but still. Of course, it isn't just really big Scandinavian furniture shops that have the power to turn living beings into mindless zombies. That utter sadist mother nature is pretty good at it too because real life zombies are surprisingly common in the natural world. Take, for example, Plesiometa argira. This poor spider is routinely chosen to play an unwitting and unhappy support role, raising the young of a certain parasitic wasp, whose breeding habits read like something out of a horror film. The wasp starts by paralyzing the spider with a single sting before laying her larvae on the surface of its body. Along with the unwanted babysitting gig, the spider receives another sinister surprise, brand new biological coding. The wasp's larvae begin to grow, sucking on the spider's bodily fluids through tiny puncture holes they make in its abdomen. To begin with, the spider basically just goes about its regular spidery business, as if a host of tiny parasites aren't making milkshakes out of its insides. But after two weeks, something changes. Through a mechanism we still don't understand, the spider will suddenly stop tending to its large circular web and will instead feel compelled to craft a small, sturdy platform unlike any web it's ever woven. 
The spider will spend the last night of its life on this crazed construction project, and its reward for finishing is to be eaten alive by the hungry larvae hanging out in its abdomen. With that final nutritious meal in their bellies, the larvae will begin spinning their cocoons, which they neatly hang from their bespoke spiderweb scaffold. Another real-life zombie is the woodlouse, also known as the pillbug, a common household critter with a fatal fetish for feces. This little poo nibbler has a particular thing for bird droppings, including those deposited by starlings. Unfortunately for the pill bug, starling digestive tracts often carry a parasite that's far more dangerous to the bug than it is to the bird. Once safely ensconced inside the pill bug, this parasite seizes control. To complete its life cycle, the parasite needs to make its way back inside a starling, and so it compels the woodlouse to seek out the most exposed location it can find. Nothing is as tantalizing to starling taste buds as a pill bug out in the open dancing the Macarena. So the insect is soon gobbled up and the parasite goes back to colonizing the gut of its original host. Clever. Disgusting and horrifying, but clever. The green banded brood sac uses similar poo based tactics, only this time it's a species of snail that eats the bird's feces. Now it's well known that snails are absolutely terrible at the Macarena, so the brood sac has yet another way of attracting the interest of the local bird population. It grows directly into the snail's eye stalks, where it begins to throb and pulsate, causing the snail to do a surprisingly good impression of a caterpillar. And before you can say Simple Simon, in swoops a bird to gobble up the snail and the brood sac along with it. Now, as horrific as all these examples are, nothing strikes as much undead fear as fungi. The natural world is made up of multiple kingdoms, with the most well known being plants, animals and Narnia. Fungi, which includes yeasts, moulds and mushrooms, have a kingdom all to themselves and judging by the name it's where you want to go to have a good time. There are of course many different types of fungi that do many different things, including entomopathogenic fungi that infect and often kill insects. One such fungus is Bavaria bassiana that can be found growing in soils all over the world. It infects insects and other anthropods by penetrating their exoskeletons and growing inside them, killing them within a few days. If that was all this fatal fungus did, I'd consider it to be pretty bloody rude, but no. Bavaria bassiana then proceeds to colonize the poor insect's corpse, its spores appearing all over the dead body before drifting off into the air in search of more stuff to murder. Bavaria bassiana is so good at wiping out certain types of insects, it actually uses a biological insecticide to control bugs like termites, aphids and beetles. It's safe to say Bavaria bassiana behaves brutally, but as far as entomopathogenic fungi go, it's actually one of the friendliest. Unlike a particular genus of fungi, known as cordyceps, which are found worldwide in tropical and temperate regions. And cordyceps have a very particular skill. It doesn't just kill its hosts, it first releases chemicals into their brains, taking control of their bodies and turning them into automatons. No wonder it's known as the zombie fungi. No one knows exactly how many cordyceps species there are, but there are at least 600 and most target a single species of insect, anything from butterflies to dragonflies and cockroaches. Ophiocordyceps curculionum attacks weevils in Central and South America. Ophiocordyceps senescus kills caterpillars up in the Himalayas. And Ophiocordyceps humberti infects wasps in Brazil, causing them to land on a leaf or branch and bite down into it before passing away. This peculiar behaviour is also seen in the effects of the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, probably the most famous of the cordyceps fungi and scourge of ants across the globe. Like its fellow zombie fungi, unilateralis gets inside its victim using special enzymes that dissolve chitin, the fibrous substance that makes up most anthropod exoskeletons. 
Once inside, the fungus takes control of the ant's brain, forcing it to climb high into a tree, where it bites down on a leaf and then pops its six tiny clogs. Soon, the fungus begins to bloom, growing out through the ant's exoskeleton into balls of spores that burst and shower down on all the ants scurrying across the forest floor below, starting the process all over again. It's a terrifying mode of operation, but it's also highly successful because cordyceps have been playing this game for a very, very long time. Fossil records show zombie ants controlled by cordyceps like fungus were taking their last bite into a leaf at least 48 million years ago. Other researchers have found a fungus infected insect stuck in amber that goes back more than 100 million years. Part of the reason for this success is fungi's adaptability. Scientists recently discovered that ants are sometimes colonized by more than one species of cordyceps. Originally, it looked like the two different parasites were living in harmony, but further research suggests that this is probably an example of hyperparasitism, a situation in which one parasite becomes infected by another. Remember I said earlier that fungi eat into insects' bodies by dissolving the chitin in their exoskeletons? Well, guess what also contains plenty of chitin? Fungi! So, in another weird turn, fungi are practically designed to infect each other, which is why some cordyceps cannibals specialise in attacking other cordyceps. So, we're talking about a hyper-adaptable organism that can colonise something thousands of times bigger than itself, taking over its mind and forcing it into some form of ritualistic suicide. Yeah, by now there should only be one question on your mind. But don't worry, there's no reason to believe humans can be infected by an as yet undiscovered fungus and turned into real life clickers from The Last of Us. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. We may be able to use these fatal fungi to our advantage. Cordyceps fungi contain a chemical called cordycepin that, in biological organisms, switches on a cellular protein called AMPK. And it turns out AMPK is pretty powerful stuff. Initial tests suggest drugs that trigger AMPK production in our bodies are able to reverse some types of diabetes and cancer, limit heart disease, and even make us live longer. And now scientists think they've found a way to grow cordyceps fungi effectively in laboratories, potentially opening up the way for new antiviral and cancer-fighting wonder drugs based on cordycepin. Of course, it might be a hard pill to swallow when hmm. you know the medicine you're taking is made from a zombie fungus. Then again, maybe it'll grow on you. Thanks for watching.